Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. Well, we uh, have had some of our people pass from this life to the next. They have departed. They didn't die because when they were born again, their eternal life started that day. And their death was recorded on the cross. But when their body quit working, they departed. And you've heard me teach for years, and to some of you, you could probably preach it better than me. But we know that Jesus is coming back. We know that there's going to be a time when Jesus appears in the sky and the dead in Christ are raised. That's talking about their bodies. And we're all gathered together in the air. And in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we get changed. And we receive our glorified, resurrected bodies. And then from then on, we're with the Lord. And I've taught that here for years. And I think anyone who sat under our teaching for any length of time, you know that. But having done two funerals in the last two days, and having people come to me and ask me questions, it came to my realization that a lot of people don't seem to understand what happens when your body quits working and between that time and the rapture. Now, we know that when the rapture takes place, we receive a resurrected, glorified body. But there is that sliver of time for those who depart, for like the two people in the last two days that, uh, at the funerals, for the people who depart, what takes place? What happens? Where are they? What are they doing? between the time that they depart and the time that Jesus returns and the dead in Christ receive their resurrected, glorified bodies. What happens? What happens? Well, we're going to explore that today. And first of all, I just want you to know that you cannot understand the things of God concerning the end of days, concerning the rapture, concerning life after death, unless you understand one basic principle. And that is this. We are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are a spirit. You are a spirit. You possess a soul. Your soul is your mind, your will, your intellect, and your emotions. And you live in a body. This body that you see right now, here in front of you, this is the house that I live in. I am not my body. I live in my body. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Since I am born again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of my spirit. And my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And my body is where I live. And what we need to understand is when the Scripture is talking about us Sometimes it's talking about our body. Sometimes it's talking about our spirit, soul, and body. And sometimes it's talking about our spirit. And if we cannot understand that we are a three-part being, we will not understand what happens in the end of days. We need to know this, that when Jesus was on the cross, let's take a look at this scripture. Luke 23, 39. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, cursed him, degraded him. And he said this, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. 
But the other, remember Jesus was crucified between two thieves who deserved what they were getting according to the law of that day. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing that you are under the same condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, what was going to happen to that man? He was going to die physically that day. And his body would have probably been thrown in the rubbish heap outside Jerusalem. But Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Now there are several things we need to understand here. First of all, the man on the cross who said that Jesus basically confessed him as the Messiah, when he did that, he did not become a born-again Christian. Why? Because at that time when Jesus was crucified, there were no Christians. The church had not been formed yet. Jesus had not put his blood on the altar in heaven yet. The church didn't exist. So Jesus was not saying that this man would be a born-again member of the church. He was saying, today you will be with me in paradise. Because remember, Jesus, according to the Scripture, Jesus was born under the law. And the law existed until Jesus put his blood on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant in heaven, not the one on earth, but the one in heaven, and that lid is called the mercy seat. And he did that after he was resurrected. You all know the story. He came out of the tomb. The stone had to be rolled away, and we have an entire message. You can look up on the internet and read why I believe the stone had to be rolled away. People say, well, wait a minute. Jesus could just appear in rooms. Later that day, he just appeared in a room that was locked. Why did the stone have to be rolled away? Well, it's because I believe, because when Jesus was resurrected, it was a glorious, magnificent, supernatural event, but I believe he was resurrected as a resurrected man. Now, Jesus told his disciples over and over and over again, I have not come here as the Son of God. I am the Son of God. God is my Father, but I am here as the Son of Man. And he experienced everything that we experience as a human. So the stone needed to be rolled away because why? Because I believe because he had not received his glorified, he had his resurrected body, but he did not have his resurrected glorified body. Remember the woman was going to touch him and he says, don't touch me. He said, don't cling to me, don't handle me. For I have not yet ascended. Go tell my brothers that I am ascending to the Father. I am not yet glorified. So what happened then? Well, later that day he shows up in a room and then a few days later he shows up again in the same room that was locked and he told him, handle me, touch me. Now, why would he tell the woman not to touch him, but he would tell them to touch him? And he said, he said, see that I am not flesh and bone. So they touched him. He, he had a flesh and bone body. Why didn't he say flesh and blood? We all say it. That's what they said back then. Because he had left his blood on the altar in heaven. And the Bible says that when we are resurrected at the rapture or caught up at the rapture if we're still alive, 
that we will receive a glorified body, a resurrected glorified body like His. So we can look at the body of Jesus after He resurrected and came back to earth and, and taught His friends and family and His disciples for 40 days. We can look at the kind of body He had and that's the resurrected glorified body that we will have and we will receive that at the rapture of the church. Now, I get a lot of flack. And when I say a lot, I mean a lot of flack from people who do not believe in the rapture of the church. They say it will never happen. Well, I don't know how they get out their spiritual scissors and cut out all the scriptures where Jesus talked about it and Paul talked about it. The rapture of the church, if you believe the Bible, it will happen, whether you believe in it or not. But... I think it's always interesting when Jesus had his glorified body, he wasn't affected by gravity. He was, he was able to move at the speed of thought. Locked rooms didn't stop him and he got to eat fish. Yeah, that's good. It's good. So when he said to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise, what was he talking about? Because the church had not been formed yet. Well, where was paradise at that particular time? Paradise was in the heart of the earth. It also went by the name of the bosom of Abraham. So, in the heart of the earth was paradise, and on a level with it, but separated, was Hades. Ephesians 4.10 says, He who descended is also the one who who ascended far above all the heavens. Now, that's interesting, because we know that Jesus ascended, but here it's telling us that the one who ascended, he, he also descended. Well, what did he do when he descended? He went into paradise. Scripture tells us, boy, he preached victory. And he went in his spirit body. How do we know that? Because his body was in the grave. Remember, the, the women went over and they prepared his body. His body didn't disappear. But we are spirit, soul, and body. And so Jesus, in his spirit body, went into the depths of the earth, into paradise. And that's where the thief on the cross went. He was, he was invited because he recognized that Jesus was the Messiah because he gave him honor. He was invited, like all of the Old, Old Testament saints before who honored God, they were considered righteous Old Testament saints. They went into the bosom of Abraham. And it's kind of interesting that uh, Abraham himself was there, and he was kind of like the doorkeeper. Now, I think that's kind of interesting. Now, we'll get back to that in just a moment. When Jesus resurrected and went to heaven, and then a few days later we had the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. From that point on, the paradise of God is not in the heart of the earth. When Jesus went to heaven and established a new group of people, and that new group of people is the church, his body, the body of Christ. When he established the new group of people, paradise moved into heaven, specifically into the third heaven. And born-again believers, when they passed, that's where their spirit body goes. Now, how do we know that there is a third heaven? Paul the Apostle actually went there. Now, 14 years before he's telling this story, he was in Lystra and he was stoned. I don't, know, I don't mean he went down to the local cantina and got drunk. <laughs> what, what I mean is, is they didn't like what Paul was preaching and the religious leaders of the day picked up rocks and they threw them at him until he was dead. That's what they did. That was their method of ex execution. 
And so they saw that he was dead, and they drug him outside the city so his body wouldn't decay inside the city. And when they drug him outside the city, some of his believing friends, some of Paul's friends, gathered around him, and he came back to life. Now that happened 14 years before he tells what he tells here. And here's what he said. 14 years after that event, he says, And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. God knows. In other words, he's saying, I don't know how this happened, but it happened. How he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for man to utter. And he actually says in that passage that he went into the third heaven. And it was so glorious, it was so wonderful in the paradise of God, which is where Christians go when your body quits working. It was so wonderful, he said there's not even words to describe this. And then I think it's kind of funny, later he's talking to his disciples and he says, I've been there and I've been here and I'd much rather be there. But because of you knuckleheads, i got to stay here and teach you. In fact, in Philippians 1.23, he said, For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. I've often thought, and I even mentioned this at uh, both of the funerals uh, this weekend, the person who is, their body is in the casket. That person. Everyone else is alive in the room, having refreshments afterwards and all that. But the person whose body is in the box, they're not there. They're in paradise. If they're a born-again believer, they're in paradise. And they're experiencing the things that Paul said was so cool that you couldn't even come up with words for it. And I've often wondered, and I, and I mentioned this at the funerals, if they could come back for just two or three minutes, it wouldn't matter what their hobbies were. It doesn't matter if they were into electronics, cars, fishing, cooking, gardening. It wouldn't matter what their, what their hobby was. It didn't matter what they just spent all their time on when they were here. I guarantee you they'd mention none of that. They would say, if they only had a couple minutes, they would say, listen, I've been there. They'd say what Paul said. I've been there and I've been here and it's much better there and I want you to be there with me and the only way you're going to be there with me is if you believe in the same Jesus Christ that I believe in and they would stress listen I've been there I've seen it you are going to love it but you're never going to see it unless you trust in Jesus so I think the what happens after our body quits working and before the rapture, we may not have our glorified bodies yet, but we'll have a spirit type of body. And it's really going to be a lot of fun. Hmm. Well, we know that Christians are in heaven because Hebrews 12.22 tells us that in heaven, uh, in, the new, in the heavenly Jerusalem, that there's angels and the church of the firstborn. It tells us in verse 23 that the church of the firstborn, that's us. We're there. We're registered. It's just kind of like the conference. When you got saved, you got registered. And somebody paid your registration. And you don't have any registration to pay. All you got to do is let your body die and show up. See, death for the Christian is not really death. When we are born again, our death is recorded on the cross. In fact, Romans 6.6 6 says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. Wow. Isn't that powerful? So if you're a born again believer, death is not in your future. It's in your past. Hmm. So, um, Jesus told a story, and I've heard ministers say this was a parable. Let me tell you something. This is not a parable. 
This is a true life event. And for those of you who study the Word, one way you can tell the difference between a parable and an, and an actual event is a parable never mentions a certain person or a name. People aren't named. It's just, you know, like there was a farmer who, you know. But if, if you say there was a farmer and his name was John Wilson, <laughs> then that was a real event. Okay? Jesus told us a story that was a real event. Now listen to this. Now keep in mind that this event took place before the church. This event took place during the same time framework that when the thief was on the cross. All right? The church did not exist. The paradise of God was still in the heart of the earth. Luke 16, 19, and this is Jesus talking. He said, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. Now, the, one of the main points of this story is not that rich people don't go to paradise. It's you don't have to be rich to go to paradise. Your money is not what determines whether you're going to be in paradise or not. It's who you, who you have received in your heart. It's whether or not you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It has nothing to do with your money. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So Jesus is giving this story of these two people. There was a, a man that was very rich and lived lavishly, and there was a guy that was so poor that he ate crumbs and dogs licked the sores on his body. Verse 22, So it was that the beggar died and was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. Now, when he died, where was his body? It was still here on the earth. It was on the earth, decaying. Remember, we are a three-part being. We are spirit, soul, and body. His spirit and soul, well, we'll see. His spirit and soul were carried where? To Abraham's bosom, to the paradise of God. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades. So where was the rich man? Verse 23. Where was the rich man? He was in Hades. And Hades is one of the three uh, Greek words that are translated hell in some of your Bibles. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw. Now what does this tell us? Now the rich man, his body was on earth decaying also. He may have had a big lavish funeral for all we know, but his body was still on the earth. His body wasn't in Hades. His spirit body was in Hades. And his with his spirit body, he was in torment. With his spirit body, he had eyes and he could see. And what could he see at that particular time? Remember, Hades and the bosom of Abraham, the paradise of God, were on the same level in the heart of the earth. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now keep in mind that when in the New Testament it's talking about bosom, it, the men had robes and on the inside of the robe there was a huge pocket and that was called the bosom of the robe. And that's where they kept their valuables. If they had some coins, you know, or something that was valuable, they would put it in their bosom. So in other words, he's saying here that Lazarus was considered valuable. Even though he was poor, he was considered valuable, and he was in the bosom of Abraham. Then he, this is the rich man, he cried out. So what's that tell us? He could speak. And with his spirit body, there's communication. He cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Now, have mercy on me. What's that mean? That means he had desire. He had desires. 
He wasn't just floating in some suspended animation. He wasn't in what some people call soul sleep. No, he had desires. And he said, send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. So in other words, there was something that he saw that could relieve his torment. And he wanted it. And he said, for I am tormented in this flame. So it was not comfortable where he was. But he could see over into the bosom of Abraham, into the paradise of God, and he could see that Lazarus evidently had water or whatever this substance was that comforted him. He had it. But Abraham said, Son, remember. What's that tell us? We have memory. In our spirit body, after we leave here, we have memory. I had, I had a person ask me yesterday at the funeral, uh, after it was over, they said, do you think, and they mentioned their relationship to this person, they said, do you think that they will remember me when I pass and I have my spirit body? Well, they, yes, we have memory. Now, somebody may say, well, then what about the bad things that we've done? You know, here's the thing. There's a lot of bad things that have happened in my life. That's where you're supposed to go, oh, oh. But you know what? You can have the memory of the bad thing without the pain of the bad thing. You know, when I was a teenager, I did a couple, three, a bunch of stupid stuff. There were some things I did looking back on it, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, it's a wonder that I survived. <laughs> but I don't have pain about it. Memory of the past without the pain of the past because we know that all that we have done has been forgiven, washed, clean. So, Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those pass from there to us. Interesting. You know, there was even some negotiation that went on. You know, if you could just send somebody back there. You know, negotiation with God doesn't really work out too good. I know that, uh, I'll, I'll make this story brief. If I made it longer, it would be funnier. But I'm going to keep it brief. Loretta had a German shepherd, and she loved this German shepherd, and and after a Bible study one night, it got lost. And so I went out looking for it, and I couldn't find it. And it was named Candle, and she really liked this dog. There were times when I wondered, Larry, dog, you know. which I mean, she really, she really liked this dog a lot. Couldn't find it. The next morning, I went out, and I went looking for it. And we had some neighbors in the neighborhood. We lived on the other side of the lake at the time. And, and uh, I went out, and I saw candle laying under a tree in this little kind of open area kind of like a little park and there was a road on the other side and there were some neighbors over there that I didn't know but they were out watering their lawn and I said oh there's there's the dog it's asleep under the tree you know I'm all by myself and so I go up there well you know candle was rigor mortis had set in candle was gone candle wasn't burning anymore and so I thought to myself, well, you know, Jesus said lay hands on the sick. And, you know, I don't want to go back and tell Loretta that the dog's dead. Yeah. I just did not want to have that situation. So I, I stood there because the neighbors are over there, you know. And this was several years ago. But I, Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak life into this dog. And I could hear the flies. Dog didn't move. It was looking at me even. And so then I thought, well, you know, maybe the Bible says lay hands on the sick. You know, it even says that 
you know, that we'll raise people from the dead. Well, if you can raise people from the dead, you can raise a dog from the dead. It's logical, right? So I just, you know, lay hands on. So I just kind of looked around to make sure the neighbors weren't. And I got down on one knee, you know, and, and I said, in the name of Jesus, candle, come back to life now. Bzzz, I can hear. Candle's just still looking at me. So I thought to myself, my lightning fast brain thought, maybe I'm not, you know, I'm not sincere because I'm concerned about the people. So I'll just raise my hand a little. <laughs> and I said the words, and he said, are you scared? I mean, that's what was coming up. So I laid hands on the dog and I got the charismatic grip on it. <laughs> and I started talking in preacher talk. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. Come, I, I tell you, come back to life now in the name of Jesus. And the dog just laid there. So I remember negotiating with God. I said, look, Lord. Now this is back before we had the church or anything. And I said, look, I know you've been talking to me about going into the ministry full time. I've got a successful business, making a lot of money. I'm, everything is good. I'm getting ready to retire. I'm not even 50 years old yet. But I, Lord, if you'll, if you'll raise this dog from the dead, I'll do everything you want me to do. I'll go into the ministry. I'll, I'll do it all. Just raise that dog from the dead. And then, finally, I heard God speak. Oh. He said, okay, let me get this straight. If I raise this dog from the dead, you'll do everything I want you to do. I raised my son from the dead, and that's not enough? In other words, you will do for a dog what you would not do for my son? Ah. It was one of those moments that I will never forget. Well, the Scripture tells us, the Scripture tells us that there's a mystery, and I, I have a lot of Scriptures here, but there's there are scriptures that tell us over and over again that there was a mystery hidden from us, but it's now been revealed. You know, it, it always gets to me when I, I hear this one verse. 1 Corinthians 2, 7. And you hear sermons on this all the time. But we speak the mystery of God, the wisdom of God in a mystery. Excuse me. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages began which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. What's that tell us right there? That it hasn't even come into our thought realm what God's got prepared for us. We can't even imagine it. And they preach a whole sermon on that. But they forget to do what Paul Harvey said. Go to the rest of the story. What's the next verse say? But God has revealed them to us through the Spirit, through His Spirit. Isn't that amazing? So what's been revealed to us? Our future, our destiny. We should not be afraid of death. We should not be afraid of the end times. We should not be afraid of the tribulation. Why? Because we are the body of Christ. We are the church. We are born again. And we move from glory to glory to glory, and every step of glory is better than the step before. It's kind of like the old song that we used to sing in the Baptist church, every day with Jesus is better than the day before. It's sweeter than the day before. Why? It just gets better and better and better. Hmm. So, why should we not fear the end of days? Because Jesus is coming back and He's taking His bride out of the earth before He pours out His wrath during the tribulation. He's not going to pour out His wrath on His bride. His bride is in heaven 
we are having the marriage supper of the Lamb while all the, all the judgment is being poured out on an unrepentant earth. And, and I say this respectfully, but maybe some people will understand it this way. Jesus is not a wife beater. He's not going to leave His bride here on the earth and then pour out His wrath, all the plagues and, and everything mentioned in Revelation. The, the Lamb is not going to pour out His wrath. And there are pages after pages after page in one of my books about how Jesus has, and the Scriptures tells us that the church is not going to experience the wrath to come. Well, the wrath to come is the tribulation. And the trumpet's going to toot, and we're going to shoot, and we're out of here. Now, if you don't believe in the rapture, if you don't believe it's going to happen, then ask me what you do with this Scripture I'm getting ready to read. This is out of the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, Concerning those who have fallen asleep, that was a phrase they used like we would say, pass away. Concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that? Even so, God will bring with him, Jesus, those who sleep in Jesus. This is where you need to understand we are spirit, soul, and body. Our spirit and soul has gone to heaven. We are with Jesus. Our body is on the earth, decaying in an urn, in a box, scattered around the world, whatever. But when Jesus comes back, God, it says, God is going to send with him all of those who sleep in Jesus. In other words, the people that we celebrated their life the last couple days, if the rapture took place today, they will be with Jesus when He returns. It's not going to be just Jesus by Himself. It's going to be Jesus and all the spirit bodies of all of the saints who are in the body of Christ, they will be with Him. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with Him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord Himself, that's talking about Jesus, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be harpazo. That is a Greek word. That's a Greek word when it was translated into the Vulgate Bible, into Latin, and I almost hate to admit it, but yes, I took Latin also. You know, you got to wonder sometimes about my mentality. You know, you're not wondering about my mentality? Okay. <laughs> For a young man to take Latin, I thought it would be an easy class. <sighs> I have Latin stories. Okay. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up. Harpazo in Latin, reparo is the Latin word there. And then it was transliterated in the King James. And it, it's, it's caught up. But that's where the word rapture comes from. It comes from the Latin word. So whether we're harpazoed, whether we're raptured, or whether we're caught up, it's all the same thing. Harpazo means snatch out. It, it means Kind of like an eagle, when an eagle goes down and gets a fish that's swimming close to the surface. It catches it out. That's what's going to happen. We're going to be caught out of the earth. Well, this is good. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, who? The dead in Christ, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. We should be comforted in this. The end for us is not the end. It's just a step to the next level. The world is going to have problems because when we're caught up, they're going to stay and they're going to go through this wrath to come. But the church is not going to. Now, 
we are told that when Jesus returns, that we're not all going to be have dead bodies in the ground. Some of us are going to be alive. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And once again, I've always thought that would be a perfect scripture to hang in the nursery in the, over at church. <laughs> we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, this is talking about how fast we're going to be changed. Not how fast we're going to be caught up, but how fast we're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's when we get our resurrected, glorified body. Wow. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. You will become immortal. I mean, think about that. You're not going to have to be a Marvel comic hero. No. Your destiny is good. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Let me tell you something. Do not fear the tribulation. Do not fear the Antichrist. Do not fear death. Do not fear. Because God has not given you the spirit of fear. But of a sound mind and, and love and, I mean, just good things. You need to understand, as a born-again believer, once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your best days are yet to come. Yes, there's, there's going to there's gonna be bumps in the road. There's going to be things that happen. The Scripture says, consider it all joy when you encounter various trials. Not if. Because it rains on the just and the unjust. When it's raining, you know, whether you're happy or sad or no matter what's going on, you need an umbrella. Well, that umbrella is Jesus, and we get one. <laughs> All right, now, there were two groups of people that were religious leaders when Jesus was here on the earth. There were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in a resurrection. They believed that. They believed in life after death. The Sadducees did not. They believed when you were dead, it was like a cockroach. You were just dead. And as Jim has reminded me many times, that's why they were very sad, you see. <laughs> you know, Jesus believed in the resurrection. You know, say, well, Paul said a lot about it, but Jesus didn't say much about it. Yes, he did. And sometimes it's tucked away in other things. You know, we, we have this one little scripture that talks about marriage in heaven and everything, and people focus on that. But kind of put that aside for a second. I want to read you a scripture here. Mark 12, 24. Jesus answered and said to them, Are you not therefore mistaken, because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they will neither marry nor... Sandy goes on. But there is a resurrection. And that resurrection is going to be glorious. But we need to understand this. From the time that your body quits working here on this earth, from that moment, you are escorted by angels into paradise, which is now in the third heaven. All right. And you have full functionality. You're going to recognize people. You're going to be able to talk. You're going to be comforted. You're going to have water to drink. I mean, it, it's, it's going to be a good time. But you, at that moment, all of these people that we've celebrated their life over the last few years here in this church who've passed on, none of them have their resurrected, glorified body. None of them. They have a spirit body, like the one described in the Bible, 
And they will get their glorified resurrected body when we get our resurrected glorified body. And that's going to be when Jesus returns and we're caught up to be with him in the air. Isn't that a glorious thought? Wow. And it could happen sooner than you think. Everything that needs to happen before Jesus comes at the second coming, which is at the end of the tribulation, hasn't happened yet. There's a lot of things prophesied in Luke and in Matthew, but that's talking about the second coming. What needs to happen before the rapture of the church? Everything that needs to happen has happened. And the next voice you hear could be a shout of the Lord, like the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God. And we could be caught up. Now, I know it's not going to happen here in the church, but out in place, certain places, you know, there's going to be cigarettes and beer cans and silicone and all kinds of stuff falling out of the sky. <laughs> because... When we go, we're going to be glorified. And your glorified body is not going to need any mechanical enhancements. And, and, and you're not going to need any stimulants to be happy. And remember the rich man who was in Hades? He didn't say, bring me a Bud Light. <laughs> he wanted water. And I guarantee you, the water that Jesus has, remember, he told the woman at the well, the water that he has is better than any substitute drink you can come up with. So God is good. And our best days are yet ahead. God is good. And our best days. Hallelujah. Stand up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory. We thank you that you have a plan, that you have revealed this mystery to us in these last days so that we can be comforted in knowing that with you, our best days are yet ahead. We love you and we glorify your holy name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen.